Now, I want to return to this gender pay gap report that came out yesterday. It has stunned me that since the release of this report, we've seen claims that this reporting will turn men into Andrew Tate supporters, that this is just a left-wing ideological issue. This is utter garbage. Equal pay is not ideology. This is simply saying that women are equal to men, that women are capable of doing the same jobs as men in corporate Australia, and that women should be paid the same. And if you don't agree with that, it's not an ideological issue, it's not left or right. You belong in the 1950s and deserve to be shamed as sexist. For all of the husbands, fathers and grandfathers watching, of course you want your daughters and wives to be paid the same as men. It's a no-brainer. Yet we're seeing dozens of companies in corporate Australia tick a box by holding an expensive International Women's Day event, their virtue signalling, but then they fail to promote women to senior positions or they don't pay them properly. I mean, the data from this report this week isn't perfect. It doesn't compare men and women in the same jobs, but it does compare how much a company pays women compared to men. And it's better having this information than not having it. No company is going to want to be on this list next year. They're going to work hard to make sure they're not named and shamed. And this means, hopefully, a whole lot of women will be promoted or will be paid more. And that just means equally than they are at the moment. It will bring about quick change. Now, people say, oh, women have children. They can't work anymore. That's why they're paid less than men. Well, this is rubbish. I don't know a woman who no longer aspires to have an interesting career just because they've had a child. Having children doesn't mean necessarily that you lose your ambition. But what it does mean is that there are scores of extremely smart mothers who find it hard, if not impossible, to get back into the work workforce after having children because companies aren't flexible. Companies are demanding nine to five or more hours instead of allowing mothers to do the work when it suits them, when the kids are at school and then later at night when their children are asleep. There needs to be major reform from companies. Well, to discuss this, joining me is Ruby Leigh Gatfield. She's Head of Research and Insights at Future Women, and she's a former senior advisor at the Workplace Gender Equality, Equality Agency, which actually published this data. Ruby, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Now, what's your response to the critics who say that the report this week is useless because it doesn't compare women and men in the same jobs? Look, I think I'd say they're actually missing the point entirely with that um, distinction because, like, that distinction is actually very intentional. Uh, when we think about comparing the pay of women and, in, and men in the same roles, of course that's really important, uh, but at the same time it's been unlawful to pay women and men un, you know, unequally for 55 years now. And so what we're actually seeing is that while you know, it is still too pervasive and happening too often, it's actually a pretty small piece of the puzzle. And what the gender pay gap does, you know, the average difference in earnings between women and men across an entire organisation or workforce, what that does is tell us a much bigger story about the roles that women and men are playing in our society and um, in our economy more broadly. And so I think what successful competitive CEOs and employers know right now mm. is that to really narrow their gender pay gap, they need to do much more than just stamp out those or eradicate those instances of unequal pay because it's a much bigger story. So, you know, excluding the careers where clearly there is a physical barrier to women doing the same jobs, you know, industries like mining or, and, and others, are we seeing across the board that women are in more junior positions and men are still being promoted but, but women aren't? Absolutely. Yes, and that's what the data tells us, right? Um, I think that there are hundreds of women, thousands of women across the country yesterday who saw that data and many of whom who reached out to me and told me that, you know, they, their industry or their employer had told them they were a leader in this space and that they had 50-50 workforce representation between women and men, um, but yet they still see this pay gap. So, you know, they're smart enough to know that what that means is that we've got far more women in these junior ranks and they're not rising to the senior ranks in the mm. same way and that's for a whole range of reasons. Look, this reporting also shows base pay and bonuses, which is quite fascinating. What does it tell us? 
Yeah, that's a really good point. I think if we look just at base pay, the data told us that the pay gap is sitting nationally at about 14%, 14 per cent, 14.5. But when they include overtime payments, discretionary payments like bonuses um, and other things like superannuation, we start to see that pay gap widen. So it sits at about 19%. Um, and so what that tells us is that there's this whole range of bias and discrimination that comes into our decision making when we think about overtime work, who we'd give our bonuses to, who we, when we're reviewing performance, reviewing pay, thinking about who we give those important jobs and projects and opportunities to, to rise um, to, we're giving them too often to men. Um, and we saw that that total remuneration gap, more than base salary, was much more common, as you say, in those male-dominated mm. industries like mining, um, where you've got that kind of site work um, or, or roles that are much harder for women um, to access because of that lack of flexibility. And in those cases, it's, of course, understandable. Um, look, these, this report also really highlighted that in a whole raft of retailers that claim to be supporting women, inspiring women, servicing women, and, and, and you know, we're often talking companies like Lorna Jane, City Chic, Sea Folly. Um, my colleague and friend Jenna Clark actually wrote about this today in the Australian mm -hmm. newspaper. Um, these colleagues, these companies literally made for women and yet they had quite eye-watering pay disparities. You're looking at them now on the screen, massive pay disparities. Does that surprise you, the hypocrisy of companies like this? Look, sadly, it doesn't. I think those in the sector have seen for years now, for decades, that we know that in every single industry category, every occupational category across the country, there is a gender pay gap. It doesn't really matter how you cut the cloth, hourly pay, annual pay. Mm. Um, we're seeing pay gaps. And even in those female dominated industries, we see it in healthcare, we see it in teaching and childcare. And so it doesn't surprise me to see it in those big retailers. Um, but I think, again, what it tells us, and, and to those critics who kind of say the pay gap is a reflection of women's choice to work in, um, you know, their choice to work in you know, nursing or choice to work part-time, um, what we're seeing is that's not necessarily the case. There's a whole range of structural barriers, our parental leave policies, our childcare policies, our access to part-time and flexible working, all of these factors actually limit the choices we can make in the workforce as women. Mm. Um, and employers play a really important role in creating that change, right? I think there's a lot we can learn from some of the employers that came out yesterday with neutral pay gaps who've done the hard yards and have narrowed their gap in a really meaningful way. Mm. Right, Ruby Leigh Gatfield, thank you so much for joining us.